Hello and welcome. My name is Simon Timpley from the Food Safety International Food Safety and Quality Network. I forgot where I was from for a minute then. Uh, it's Food Safety Fridays. Hooray. Uh, and today's topic is differences in food fraud between the USA and Europe. And today's special guest presenter, our friend Earl Arnold from AIB International. Welcome, Earl. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, everybody, for joining Lovely to have you along again. You've presented oh, several times with us now, and it's always an engaging presentation, so I always look forward to it with you. And uh, can you just let the audience know where you're joining us from today, Earl? Yeah, I'm joining from very sunny and hot Austin, Texas today. And what temperature is it? Oh, I think it's reached up to 89 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's projected to reach up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And it's actually hot in Manchester today in the UK. We're in the 30s centigrade. So we're probably in the 80s Fahrenheit. Yes. And we don't have any air con. <laughs> we don't need it. Anyway, um, audience, say hello in the sidebar, telling us where you're joining us from. And if you're new, just type new and tell us where you're from, because it'll be good to see uh, if we've got anybody uh, new online as well. Um, these Food Safety Fridays webinars are sponsored kindly. I'm going to play the sponsor ads now, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes, okay? The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, we're back. Uh, thanks to sponsors and uh, one of the sponsors, AIB International. That's where Earl's from. Uh, have, have you been following the chat, Earl? Have you seen all the? I have. It looks like we have everybody from everywhere. That's awesome. Yeah, and lots of new people. So everybody's welcome. And the, the new people, I uh, hope you enjoy today. And uh, we're a friendly lot and uh, hope you keep coming back. So I'll get your slides up, Earl, and then we can get cracking with the presentation. Okay, okay I'll be back for the Q&A later. There we go. All right. Well, again, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining. And thank you, Simon, for uh, the uh, kind introduction. Um, today, we're going to discuss food fraud, and we're going to look at the similarities and differences between the U.S. and Europe. We're going to look at it from a regulatory perspective, as well as uh, from a best practice or uh, consumer practice. 
So this is the agenda we're going to cover. We're going to first go ahead and discuss what is food fraud. And then we're going to talk about the different types of food fraud and some uh, just a few examples of what food fraud is. Then we're going to cover some of the U.S. regulatory requirements, some of the European Union regulatory requirements. And then we're going to talk about the GFSI and third party requirements. And then at the end, we're going to cover the similarities and differences between uh, these, these programs and requirements. So first, we're going to discuss what is food fraud. And before we do, we're going to do a poll question to see how um, all of you out there uh, interpret or determine food fraud from a definition standpoint. So the first poll question is, what is food fraud? Is it either A, an intentional act to create harm? Is it B, a deliberate and intentional substitution, addition, tampering, or misrepresentation? Rep misrepresentation of food, food ingredients or food packaging or false misleading statements made about a product for economic gain? Or is it C, an intentional act not associated with food safety and would only affect quality? Okay, I've loaded the poll. Uh, uh, can you see it in the sidebar? Well, you'll, you will do under the polls um, icon. I can see that, yes. Yeah, so 90, 90 odd, high 90% are going for, I won't read it out, B. Yes, correct. Is that correct? That is the correct answer. It is the, the deliberate or intentional substitution or addition. And the key here is for economic gain. What's really important to remember and understand, food fraud can lead to food safety issues or it can just be misleading or um, create quality issues. So outstanding, excellent, guys. Now, there is no true standardized, de standardized definition from food fraud. There's a lot of experts that have different types of definitions. And so we have a few here. So the first definition is from uh, Professor Tony Hines, who uh, w was with the Leatherhead Food Research Association. Um, you guys might have heard his name before, but his definition is a dishonest act or emission relating to the production or supply of food, which is intended for personal gain or to cause loss to another party. Another expert coming out of the Michigan State University in the United States, Dr. John Spinks, who is one of the directors there, his definition, and this is the one that most people tend to gravitate towards to include GFSI, is a collective term used to encompass the deliberate and intentional substitution of them, uh, and, and basically it was the definition that we uh, observed in the polls. Now last, and of course we're just always unique, the FDA has a slight different idea of what food fraud is or what food fraud should be considered. And they call it economically motivated adulteration. And this basically is just historical evidence of fraud that has led to a food safety issue. And when we go through the rest of this presentation, we're going to have an example or two of what uh, FDA kind of sees as economically motivated adulteration. Now, these are the different types of food fraud that most countries and even GFSI says has to be considered when you're looking at the potential of fraud occurring in your facility. So dilution is basically watering down a product using either um, unsafe liquids or unpotable water or maybe even just potable water. Um, and it's not just water, but other types. So like you could dilute oils with less quality oils. We have gray market and gray market is basically um, sale of excess or unreported product, which also could be similar to, you know, like buying something on the black market as an example. Uh, substitutions, like um, adding in, um, you have sunflower oil and you're going to partially substitute some of that with mineral oil and blend it together to maybe save a little money or gain economically. We have counterfeiting, which is just basically copying popular foods, but it is not produced with the same uh, acceptable safety assurances. We have unimproved enhancements. This is basically the use of author or unauthorized additives. Uh, a good example of this many years ago was when Sudan dyes were used in spices to make them a brighter red in uh, palm oils and things like that. We have mislabeling, which is basically, you know, uh, fibbing about the expiration date or the 
origin of where that product is coming from. An example of like claiming that um, olive oil is coming from Spain when it's actually coming from, you know, Morocco or something like this. And then we have concealment. This is basically um, hiding um, lower grade product within good grade product or harmful food coloring applied to fresh fruit to, co to cover defects. Uh, one of the things I've seen before is um, company or not companies, but individuals adding in copper to olives to make them a brighter green when these olives were definitely uh, beyond or should have not have been used because they were old and outdated. So um, these are just examples. Some other could be something like olive oil being diluted with potentially toxic tree oil, hydrolyzed leather protein in milk. Uh, pro poultry injected with hormones uh, to help control or, or hide or diseases, uh, mislabeled recycling cooking oil, uh, melamine added into uh, milk, and then of course, uh, uh, like we mentioned, adding in Sudan dyes to uh, product. So who does food fraud affect? It affects everyone. It infects or it affects manufacturers because they're the ones that might have issues and not knowing that a fraudulent uh, issue has occurred and now they're trying to track down why they're having quality issues. It affects the retailers because their finished product might not come out right because of the poor quality. It also affects the consumers because their hard-earned money that they're using to buy a product and expecting something comes out to be something else. If you go to the worst case scenarios where the food fraud could lead to food safety issues, it affects manufacturers because then, you know, there's potential for lawsuits or recalling product where that could be a, a financial burden. For consumers, if they're ill, they might have to go to the doctor and there's those added doctor bills and additionally, um, maybe even time loss from work and so losing those wages as well. So it affects everyone. Food fraud is historic. Food fraud has been around since man started manipulating food all the way back to when we started uh, um, cooking food and even adding in uh, salts to make food last a little bit longer. Um, in fact, there's laws dating back all the way to Roman times about how it was illegal to um, add things like uh, uh, lead and those kind of things to increase the longevity or make the wine sweeter as an example. Um, global supply chain and increasing food prices provides greater opportunity and incentives for rewards. A good example is kind of like what's going now and uh, on with the world with COVID. There is a potential increased risk where for fraudsters, those that want to do these types of things, might find it attractive to do so. Uh, I give an example for in the United States. Many of you may have noticed this, but in the meat industry, there's been a few facilities that have been closed down due to positive cases. Well, with those closures, it impacts a supply chain where fraudsters might feel, hey, you know what? I know there might be a shortage of chicken or whatever it might be. So maybe I can go ahead and create some kind of fraudulent activity and economically gain in this crisis. So just an example. Um, food fraud is on a spectrum from simply either misleading to very sophisticated. Um, it's about misleading the food chain, the consumers, and it could lead to safety and health issues. Fraudsters are also difficult to detect because think about um, how many times you may have went out and bought a product, and I'm not talking about just food, but you know, you may have took a vacation to Egypt and you were looking at buying some, some type of uh, jewelry or whatever, and then when you get home, you thought you bought gold and you end up taking it and finding out that it's not those types of things or um, Gucci bags or, um, you know, Rolex watches and you find out it's not uh, actually real. It's really hard sometimes to detect those types of uh, fraud, fraudulent activities. So um, current economic climate will possibly boost demand for cheaper products and consumers trying to get premium goods at reduced costs. It's important to remember that it's not only about the financial aspect of fraud, but also that the deliberate misdescription, adulteration of foods can have health implications as seen with regards to lesser quality uh, wines, um, whiskeys, and you may have remembered what happened in Puerto Rico um, probably about a year, year and a half ago.
Um, experience tells us that unsurprisingly, people will go to great lengths to cover their tracks when it comes to fraud. Fraudsters are quick to disappear, given the slightest indication of any interest from enforcement agencies. So due to the global supply chain and how everything is now, if you go back and you look at the food supply chain in the 60s and 70s, most manufacturing environments were purchasing from local suppliers. But now with the onset of faster and, and quicker travel from different countries, now we're purchasing things from all over the world. So food fraud is a major issue because it's an international problem. Uh, border control issues, think about how, you know, you probably have seen um, uh, many documentaries about how drugs and uh, people are transported across borders illegally. Um, local authorities themselves have limited resources. In fact, uh, I just use the United States as an example. We have border patrol agents that are on the border when people are driving from either Canada or Mexico, but there's so much traffic coming through those checkpoints that it's impossible for border agents to check every single truck or every single car because resources are stretched thin. So it's unrealistic for us to think that those types of local authorities is going to help minimize or significantly reduce potential fraudulent activity. Fraud ranges, again, we talked about from the anecdotal to so forth. So it's really hard to predict what the next issue is going to be. Uh, if you go back you know, to 2007 and 8, when melamine was added in to increase protein values in uh, pet food and in uh, dairy products from China, um, I, once everybody started testing for melamine in those types of products, the fraudsters have moved on to something else. And it's so hard to detect what that something else is going to be and how big of an impact it's going to reach to. So now we're going to talk about a few uh, food fraud examples. Here's one. And this is one of the first cases where someone was actually uh, sentenced and, and, and put in jail for food fraud for selling fake wine in the U.S. So wine fraudster Rudy Kawani, who was 37, was sentenced to 10 years in jail and he had to pay back over $20 million uh, for his role in selling fake wine across uh, the globe. He was also ordered to pay $28.4 million to an actual billionaire, William Koch, because he fraudulated him even more. He was the first person, again, like I said, in the U.S. to go to jail for fraud. Another example happened in New Zealand where an egg farmer there decided to put on his cases of eggs he was selling that they were free range, but realistically it was not free range. And he was only sentenced to 12 months home detention for doing this. And the funny thing is, as you can see here, he actually claimed that everybody was doing it. He wasn't the only one, but of course, everybody else in the industry came back and said, no, we're not. So he did this only between April in 2010 and November of 2011. And he sold more than 206,000 dozen eggs with the claim of being free range, which also had an increased cost. And you can see there that he ended up generating over more than $1 million just in that short time frame of, uh, for economic gain of falsely saying that his eggs were uh, cage free. Um, and we already talked about this a little bit. So uh, melamine first was uh, added in pet food in 2007, and it caused a lot of pet food industry to recall product because melamine was found in it. And also in China in 2008, over 300,000 children were made ill and six uh, uh, very young children were killed because of melamine being added into uh, the dairy that was used in making uh, infant formula. And melamine is a carcinogenic organic-based chemical, and it's rich in nitrogen. And at that time, individuals were testing the, in, the protein levels and ingredients by looking at nitrogen levels. And so melamine falsely increased nitrogen levels where individuals were getting paid more for their product, and even though it was not as good as it should have been. And normally melamine is used in like things that make those plastic silverware and whiteboards and things like this. This also 
is a good example of FDA's definition of economically motivated adulteration. This is a historical food fraud issue that melamine has been added into products to create a fraudulent event and it led to food safety issues. So this would be an example of what FDA would want you to consider when you're looking at your food fraud program. Now we're gonna move in and talk about some of the regulatory requirements between Europe, the United States, and even look at GFSI. So a facility that is subject to the regulation of preventative controls for human food, which is 21 CFR uh, 117, is required to do a hazard analysis and they need to identify and evaluate for any known or reasonably foreseeable hazard for each type of food that they manufacture, ingredient coming in, as well as all of their processing steps. It's similar to HACCP, but there's, a, there's quite a few more requirements than what HACCP asks for when you're looking at your hazards and, and how you treat them. Um, when you're looking at this, the first step of doing your hazard analysis is you need to identify uh, which, and you must consider all known and reasonably foreseeable hazards. This includes biological, chemical, and physical hazards that are traditionally required to assess for HACCP, but you also need to consider radiological, and then also, like I mentioned, economically motivated adulteration. And the hazard must consider hazards that may be present in the food because they occur naturally or unintentionally for economic gain. But even before the Food Safety Modernization Act was written and required preventative controls for human food and also animal food, there were already laws on the book in the United States all the way back to the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act of 1938. And as you can see on here, there's sections within the regulation that state that um, you cannot adulterate or misbrand foods. And if the food would be misbranded, um, if it has represented itself as a standardized food, unless it is conformed to the following laws, providing uh, three kind of food standards. So there's definitions of identity. So if you're saying corn whole, then that, that's what we're talking about. They identify uh, the identity and there's an actual um, nomenclature or statement of what that is. Standards of quality, so depending upon the grade or whatever, it has to meet those requirements and also standards of regulating the fill of the container. So basically they're saying you can't say you have six ounces and really you only have four or 4.5. So here all the way back in 1938, the United States already had laws in place to prevent fraud or misbranding, but that's all it was, was laws. There was really no enforcement behind it. There was really no meat behind it unless it became really belligerent. In, in 2011, when the Food Safety Modernization Act was signed into law, a lot more emphasis was put on facilities developing plans to prevent it from even occurring. But again, the focus for FDA is food fraud that only leads to a food safety issue. For the European Union, there's also clauses and regulations that go along with prevention of food fraud. In um, the EU 2017-625, in Clause 22, there's um, uh, discussions of markets and agricultural products. It basically says that verification of compliance with the rules on the common organization of agricultural markets has to be standardized. And basically, there has to be verifications in place that these items are actually what they say they are. In Clause 32, it talks about um, the components of authorities should perform official controls, basically tests and sampling to make sure fraudulent activities are not going on in the market. On all sectors and in relation to operators governed by the, the union on the agricultural food, claim, uh, food chain legislation, and then as you can see in clause 73, for the performance of official controls and other official activities, which are aimed at identifying possible violations to the rules, including those perpetuated through fraudulent or deceptive practices, and in the field of animal welfare, the competent authority should have access to updated, reliable, and consistent technical data to research findings, new techniques, and expertise necessary for the correct application of uh, legislation applicable in those two areas. So 
there is many regulations that are that are tied to uh, fraud in the European Union. However, this is just one of them. There's multiple that went through. There's just so many that I couldn't really uh, spend a lot of time on all of the requirements for the European Union. Even the United Kingdom has requirements for prevention of fraud. All the way back to the, I mean, way before, I'm talking way back to the Middle Ages, uh, there was actually laws on the books for food fraud in the UK. But as recently as 1990 and the Food Safety Act, there's put in consumer protection clauses, which uh, basically says selling food not of the nature or substance or quality demanded, any person who sells to the purchaser's prejudice, any food which is not of the nature or substance or quality demanded by the purchaser shall be guilty of an offense. And it goes on to talk about how falsely describing or even presenting food is a criminal offense. And then the Food Fraud Act in 2000, or I'm sorry, the Fraud Act in 2006 also included uh, additional um, information about fraud, about falsely representing anything. This is not specifically for food, but is also for food. And also fraud by failing to disclose information. So maybe you're not saying everything you should is also an act of fraud. And of course, making or supplying articles of use in fraudulent activities. So this does not necessarily always focusing on food, but this could also fit with counterfeiting products, but also deals with other types of fraudulent activity as well. Now we're gonna go over and talk about the various GFSI requirements. Now GFSI writes a standard and the other organizations such as those listed here develops their own standards that includes and in some cases enhances what GFSI has put in their standard. So some of the GFSI standards like FSSC 22000, SQF, BRC, IFS, and others take what the GFSI have put in their standards and then include it in theirs. And, and like I said, in some cases enhances it. And we're gonna see a couple of examples. But before we do, we have our second poll question. So under, it doesn't matter which GFSI standard we're discussing, FSSC, BRC, whatever, what are the two main requirements for food fraud? Is it A, food fraud vulnerability assessment? Is it B, independent laboratory ingredient testing? Is it C, food fraud mitigation plan? Or is it D, delegating risky supplier audits? Now I will tell you, there's more than one correct answer here. Okay, um, I've, I've put the poll in the sidebar. Um, you can't pick two choices, unfortunately. Oh, I'm you sorry. Can only pick, yeah, it's it's fine. You can only pick one, but you can type in the sidebar if if you if you think it's A B. Type in the sidebar. Um, but most people are seeing A and C, and that is correct. So food fraud vulnerability assessment is required underneath GFSI, and it really doesn't matter which program and also a food fraud mitigation plan is required if you identify significant vulnerabilities. So excellent guys. This is what version 7.2, this was the first time food fraud was introduced into the GFSI standard requires. So the standard on underneath uh, 21 says, the standard shall require that the organization has a documented food fraud vulnerability assessment procedure in place to identify potential vulnerability and prioritize food fraud mitigation measures. When it comes to the food fraud plan underneath 22.1, it says the standard shall require that the organization has a documented plan in place that specifies the measures the organization has implemented to mitigate the public health risks from the identified food fraud vulnerabilities. And last, the standard shall require that the organization's food fraud mitigation plan shall be supported by the food safety management system. Now that's GFSI. Once GFSI wrote version 7.2, all the other um, um, schemes created their own standard that included. In version 4.1, FSSC brought out the requirements of food fraud for their program. And as you can see here, on this one, it's almost verbatim what GFSI said. They enhanced it just a little bit. So they required the organization to have that documented and implemented vulnerability assessment. 
It needed to identify um, vulnerabilities and develop measures and prioritize them. And two, they had to identify vulnerabilities that the organization shall assess the susceptibility of products to potential food fraud. The enhancement here is in GFSI, they never mentioned necessarily that everything had to be considered. But FSSE says you have to also assess your own products for the susceptibility and potential for food fraud. And then, of course, uh, the last statement here saying that all your procedures have to be part of your food safety management system. BRC, in my opinion, is the most strict requirement for food fraud out of all of the GFSI schemes. The main reason is because they clearly convey what has to be considered within the vulnerability assessment. As you can see here underneath 542, it says that a documented vulnerability assessment shall be carried out on all food, raw materials, and groups of raw materials to assess the potential of adulteration or substitution. And the vulnerability assessment needs to take into account the following. Historical evidence of substitution or adulteration. Economic factors which may make adulteration or substitutions more attractive. The ease of access to those raw materials through the entire supply chain. The sophistication of what you do for testing to help identify adulterants and also the nature of the raw material itself. So within the vulnerability assessment, if you're following BRC, you have to include this somehow in your entire vulnerability assessment and be able to demonstrate that you're considering all of these factors. Um, there is more to it, as you can see. So BRC, like I mentioned, has a lot of different uh, requirements. To include, if you take a look at 544, it adds more things that also needs to be considered. So where products are labeled or claims are made, so as an example, like saying if you're claiming organics or shell-free eggs or even kosher or halal, then you need to also, or if you're even claiming, you know, provenance or origin, you need to consider these factors here. The only thing that BRC differentiates with for everybody else is they do not require packaging to be considered in fraudulent activity. All the other schemes do not exclude packaging. Even AIB International, we also do audits and we have our own that's called an, a, a GMP inspection. We have a requirement for facilities to consider food fraud. We tie it to the approved supplier program and as you can see here, underneath 5.19, a current and accurate list of approved and non-approved suppliers based on food safety and economically motivated adulteration risks or food fraud. Now, if you end up doing a vulnerability assessment, whether it's for FDA, whether it's for um, the European Union or UK, or you're looking at um, a GFSI requirement or standard, then you need to determine what controls you're gonna implement if you identify anything that's considered high risk. So what can you do? When you're doing your food fraud vulnerability assessment, you wanna consider basically a few things. You wanna list your raw materials or groups of raw materials. And again, remember I said BRC excludes packaging material, but the other schemes do not. So you want to list your ingredients and your materials and don't forget your finished product. And then you want to look at food fraud risk. Now you need to identify all types of food fraud that we went over. So um, dilution, substitutions, gray market, you have to consider all those types of fraud and how it can occur. And then if you're looking at BRC and it's suggested really for others, if you want a really robust vulnerability assessment, you want to determine your risk factors, whatever that might be. It could be history of food fraud. It could be um, how complicated your supply chain is. It could be your relationship with your supplier. I mean, there's many things to consider on what could decrease or increase your risk of fraud. Once you identify those factors, then you want to develop a risk rating model. So how are you going to determine your risk based on likelihood and severity? If you only have one factor, this is relatively easy. You can just overall determine likelihood and severity and give your answer. But if you're using multiple factors like BRC is suggesting you do, 
then you need to determine overall, if you identify, say, a low, medium, and high, or one, two, three, or whatever risk factor rating system you do, you're going to have to evaluate, well, what's a one for history? What's a two for history of fraud? What's a three of history for fraud? And, and for all the other factors, too. And then once you're done at the end, you have to have an overall risk matrix system of if you have a one here and a three here and a four and you know, a two here, what's your overall score need to be for it to be considered high risk for fraud and where you need to implement those controls. And then when you identify something high risk, you need to identify those control measures if required and then implement those controls and then continually review your program. Possible controls and this is coming right out of the BRC training guide for food fraud. These are suggested prevent, um, um, controls, but as you can see, BRC kind of rates these from either least effective to most effective. And if you look all the way down here, certificate of analysis is the least effective. And at first when I saw this, I'm like, why would that be? But realistically, how good is just a piece of paper? Could that also be falsified or fraudulent when you get it from that supplier? So, and then of course, final product testing. These two are also low on the list because of the fact that when you're testing something, it's specific. So you might be testing for say melamine, but maybe not the newest thing that's out there that, that, that fraudsters are doing as an example. And it's really not expected for you to test for everything either. That's why that's also on the low totem pole. If you look up on the most effective, supplier approval, solid supplier approval programs with verification is a great potential mitigation strategy. And even eliminating those suppliers that um, you have trouble with. So next we're gonna talk about those similarities and differences. So the similarities are when it comes to regulatory requirements, and I don't care what country you're talking about, they all have laws already in place and have for many, many years on it's illegal to add or substitute or create a fraudulent event. It's always been there in laws. Most of the laws now in most countries, whether we're talking about the European Union, United States, or, or even anywhere else, there is a requirement to assess the risks. Like uh, as an example, in, in the United States for the uh, Food and Drug um, or for the Food Safety Modernization Act, there's a requirement to assess for EMA. And there's a requirement to establish programs and controls to reduce the risk. It doesn't matter what country you're talking about or if we're talking about GFSI, all of those programs require us to do something similar to that nature. The differences are how to go about it. So there is... In, in a lot of cases for countries, not a specific requirement on how you're supposed to prevent food fraud. I mean, even in the United States, as an example, um, you only have to uh, significantly minimize or reduce your potential to food fraud, but it's not all. FDA is only worried about food safety food fraud. No, they, don't care, they, they, they are not necessarily concerned with um, fraud that just goes to quality, like say mixing corn syrup with honey as an example. That's a good example of food fraud, but if it was done safely, there's no food safety implications tied to it. There's also, from the regulatory standpoint, no true definition on how you have to assess for food fraud risks. The only um, standard that has how you're supposed to do this is BRC. When it comes to the others, it just says do a vulnerability assessment. There's no requirements tied to what the vulnerability assessment needs to look like or what it has to consider. And there is no requirements from any country or any GFSI standard on how you have to control it. Your options are open. So that's the major differences between the three. And again, as another separation or difference, for the US, you only have to implement controls for food fraud that leads to food safety issues. GFSI, if the risk is high and that's what you evaluated, they want you to control all potential food fraud. So major differences between the two. And then, of course, the last one is what types of food fraud to consider. That's a major difference, too. In, in Europe and in the um, UK, there's been a lot of drive to include 
even those things that are not quality related. And I actually agree with this type of thought process. As a consumer, you know, um, if I am purchasing something, I want to be assured I'm getting what I paid for and not uh, something else. So I, I kind of feel this way too as well. So in summary, we kind of defined what food fraud was and really learned that there's not a true defined definition except for one regulatory requirement by the U.S. We talked about the different types of food fraud and even uh, had some examples of uh, food fraud that's happened from around the world. And as we uh, showed in the examples, every country can be impacted by food fraud. We've seen an example from the U.S. We've seen an example from New Zealand. We've seen an example from China. Um, all, and, and again, that's not the only countries that is associated with fraudulent activity. Um, it's, it's global. It's across everywhere. We also reviewed the U.S. regulatory requirements, European and U.K. regulatory requirements from a fraudulent food perspective. And then we also outlined the GFSI and other third-party requirements and what those were. And then last, we discussed similarities and differences. Simon, we've reached that point where um, we uh, are going to do the questions and answers. But I do want to say one more thing before we jump into that. Okay. Um, when we do close, and, and I know you, you probably are going to follow up with this, Simon's going to be sure to send out an email to follow up for this webinar. Um, within that, we're going to be including um, a link to a free download that allows you to see the six steps to mitigate food fraud guide that we've created at AIB. And also, just as a little side note and a shameful plug, we actually do have a food fraud course that we teach, and another one's coming up in October. So if you are interested, that link will be included in there too as well, if you so choose to want to take a look at it. Super. Yeah, we'll be doing that. Uh, switch your webcam back on, Earl. Thanks very much for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, good primer. Uh, I will put the link to the full course in the follow-up email and also to the um, downloadable uh, guide as well. So let's um there are quite a lot of questions as you would expect <laughs> um right what about is it food fraud if a package contains more than specified <laughs> realistically it would depend on what that more is if it's just excess product like an accident happened where we put more in the content nobody's going to see that as food fraud however if the more in there is adulterated in some way, fraudulently for economic gain, then then it would be food fraud, if that makes sense. Okay. And a uh, question from, it's disappeared now, from Hugh. Uh, is, there a, uh, is there a greater risk when you buy from, um, let's say, a trader or a broker rather than a direct supplier, e.g. the horse meat scandal in the EU? So honestly, that just depends on your facility and your programs. There are very good, reputable brokers out there that do everything they can to make sure their product is authentic and safe. Um, but this is where your programs come into place and your approved supplier program. If you have a really good approved supplier program, this would even go towards brokers. One of the things you could do is go do your own audit at that broker to see what their programs are like and how good do they manage those types of things. You could also rely on third-party audits and say, broker, uh, I'm going to have, you know, I would like you to get a GFSI audit or an audit from AIB, and they can uh, uh, assure us with that report that um, you're doing the right things. So you can put verification measures in place to reduce your risk. Okay, super. Um, scrolling through. Uh, does European regulations about food fraud cover the US one as well? Um. So in most parts, yes. And what I mean by that is the laws and regulations of any country says you're not supposed to adulterate the product. Maybe not in that exact language, but they're all very similar. So that's already a law. And it, it and so if you're making product in, the, in Europe and you're, sorry about that guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
if you are making product in Europe somewhere and sending it to the United States, it's got to conform to the FDA regulations too. But um, if we are uh, making product in the United States and sending it to Europe, we have to conform to not only the U.S. standards, but European laws and regulations as well. Okie dokie. Uh, Michael, uh, how has the import of Asian foods impacted in terms of food fraud to compliance to food fraud and defense? Do the Chinese, Japanese, <laughs> Koreans have standards that govern food fraud? Sorry. It's okay. No problem. Um, yeah. So, Earl, um, we talked about uh, US, UK, EU. What about, are you familiar with Asia uh, in terms of food fraud? You know, there's a lot of imported food from Asia. There is. Um, China has been doing a major upgrade to all of their food laws, similar to what the United States did for the Food Safety Modernization Act. And um, within those laws, they're including information and requirements for food fraud. Other countries in Asia either have implemented these or are. The problem is enforcement. China is so huge. And even though they took it very seriously, you can go back and look at what happened after the melamine incident in China where those 300,000 uh, young babies were hurt. There was criminal prosecutions and even executions for those that were found guilty and involved. But it's really hard, just like in the United States or even in the UK, for inspectors or government agencies to be at every facility at every moment, making sure that things are always done the right way. So I hope that kind of answers that question. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Nandish, uh, do we have to identify and add more testing requirements for all raw materials or, yeah? So realistically, no. There's many other things you can do if you identify the risk of fraud. And the most economical one is, I don't know anybody honestly in the world that doesn't require their suppliers of some sort to have audits. This alone, if the audit does focus on the food fraud program, or at least reviews it, should help mitigate that risk of fraudulent activity coming from that program. As an example, if you're buying wheat from a mill and you're auditing them annually or a, a third party auditor is doing it and that scheme requires food fraud to be an element, then that means that that auditor is going to look at food fraud in that program that facility has. And if there's gaps in it, then obviously there's going to be observations in that report. If it's solid, then it shows that they're doing their best to minimize fraudulent activity. But if you do have a specific concern, you know, I would I'll just use melamine as an example, then you could do testing of those ingredients that might have that potential issue. But it's not a requirement anywhere to do anything specifically, if that makes sense. You have many options to choose from. Okay, it does, yeah. Uh, Darlene, should the BRC requirements, talking specifically about BRC, include both process steps and all materials or just materials? So when you're looking at food fraud. So when it comes to food fraud, BRC is still asking for you to consider things that could occur in your products too as well, but it doesn't really require you to look at each processing step in your facility. Just overall within your process, is there a risk of potential fraudulent activity? And if you identify it as high, then you would implement controls. A, a good example might be something like, uh, let's talk about weights and measures, right? Um, an unreputable company might decide to even short something as, as small as a half an ounce. And if you're talking about thousands of packaging, that, that's a significant cost savings. But if there's no history of that happening into your facility or anything like that and you calibrate your equipment, then I wouldn't risk that. You know, I would not risk rate that high. Technically, it's really not going to benefit an employee to do any fraud in your facility. They're not getting that paycheck from, you know, from that product that's being sold. So realistically, most facilities identify for their finished product low risk. Where it could be high risk, honestly, is those things that can occur like theft or loss of product, right? Where did it go and could it be put on the gray market or, or things like that? That's what you're kind of like realistically worried about from a facility level. Um, that was a question actually that scrolled away before. What is the gray market? So gray market is basically um, from, from a larger perspective, 
you've put on your books that you produced 100 pounds of XYZ product. But realistically, you produced 300 pounds. So you only have to pay taxes on that 100 pounds. You, you send it off to the retail chain and all that. But that 200 pounds, you take it and you sell it on the markets and there's no taxes associated with it um, and, and so forth like that. Um, I've seen a, a couple of cases and, and this is no, um, this does not mean Mexico's horrible, but I've heard a few companies down there that products will get stolen. And then when you're driving on the streets in Mexico before COVID, um, there was a lot of street vendors trying to come up to cars to sell product. And in some cases, eventually it was found that some of that was quote gray market. In other words, it was stolen and they were just selling it on the market or on the streets, no taxes or anything associated with it. Okay, very good. Uh, got a bit of a long one. Lorenzo, what about the practice of freezing chilled vacuum packed bovine meats just some days before the terminus of the shelf life, giving them a new shelf life of 24 months? It's often noted on meats from South America, Brazil, uh, addressed to EU markets and managed by brokers. That would be a good example of potential fraud. In fact, uh, um, in, in our food fraud course, we have an example of where a company froze beef because the price and cost was really low. So they froze a whole bunch of cases. And then when the market came back to the normal value, they bought it and sold it as fresh. So realistically, that's fraud because it was previously frozen, so there could be less quality as an example. So yes, that is potentially fraudulent uh, uh, activity if they're not disclosing something like that. Okay, Nicole, um, please clarify requirements associated with employee training. Okay, so from a um, FDA standpoint, Everybody that's involved in food safety or the food safety plan, that's where you're supposed to consider EMA. It has to be included into your hazard analysis. And everybody that has a role in food safety has to be qualified for their role. When it comes to GFSI, only those involved need to be trained for their specific role. So whoever's developing the vulnerability assessment and conducting it needs to have a lot of training or experience with fraud or understanding of what's required. If I am just a receiver and I'm just required to make sure that the C of A came in and it, and it gives the right results of the test, then I only need to train specifically on that and, and why it's important for food fraud. And that's all I need. Okay. And uh, Mary, uh, where's the best place to find current and historical food fraud? Ooh, that's a good one. So there's a lot of great resources out there. Some are paid for and some are free. So a, a paid for service is called Horizon Scan. It's, it's one word. It's not to be confused with the term Horizon Scan that's used within the GFSI standard. It's a database that you can use and you pay for it. But it can allow you to do many different things. You can type in ingredient profiles, hit enter, and look at fraudulent activity. Um, and it even shows you food safety fraud too as well. And you get nice graphs, bells, and whistles. Another um, product similar is, is uh, Discernus. Uh, it used to be USP's food fraud database, but Discernus bought it out, and, it's, and they've improved upon it, and they own it. A free resource is called Trello.com. The best way to go there is in Google or whatever search engine, type in uh, Trello food fraud. Now, it's not as attractive as the paid for services because you manually have to go through, but they have um, tabs of, of primary products like, say, dairy. And then underneath that, you can look at specific dairy products and it gives historical information or even um, important trending information on fraud for that product. So just uh, three resources that are out there. Okay. And uh, Narang Chai, is food integrity similar to food fraud? Absolutely. It's one and the same. Now, if you're not uh, uh, declaring what's in your food or maintaining its integrity, it could be construed as food fraud. Okay, Camilla, um, can veterinary drug concentration over MRL standard uh, in protein food be considered a food fraud? Absolutely. If you're saying uh, that you're only using this much and you're using more, and especially if you...
especially if you are uh, uh, declaring things like that or even declaring no uh, drugs were utilized, that would be a fraudulent event. Okay, definition of EMA. So EMA stands for Economically Motivated Adulteration. And this is a uh, FDA US term that means food fraud with the food safety issue only. Um, okay. Um, you know, in the um, the download that we're going to send the AIB guidance, is, is there a sort of a, there's not a food fraud template in there or is there? A, there's like, not a food fraud template in there, but there is a, a quick step guide. However, in our full course, we um, do working group exercises, which allows you to do a develop a comprehensive vulnerability assessment. And we provide that template in the course. It's free. It's not anything you have to pay for. And if you choose to use it, you can. But like I've said before, there's no true requirement for whatever format you use to do it. Another free tool out there some of you might be familiar with is S-Safe that's been developed by SS and PWC. And it's a really comprehensive vulnerability assessment, but really it's 50 questions long and it's supposed to be done on all your ingredients and products. But it, it, so it makes it lengthy, but it's very detailed. OK, a couple of good tips there. Uh, Srin Vasulu, uh, can, can you provide any? Do you know of any examples of uh, fraud of packaging? So about the only thing that I'm aware of is false claims. So a lot of you out there have a company make your packaging for you to include your labels and standards and things like this. And if that packaging is uh, uh, falsified, um, then, then uh, that could be a fraudulent issue. Also, say for instance, you're requiring food grade materials because it's gonna touch your product and the supplier gives you non-food grade type materials and packaging. So those are just a few examples of fraud for packaging. Okay, an interesting question from Ashan. How can a consumer know that the food he is eating is exactly the same as written on the label? <laughs> <laughs> That's the crux of the issue. In a lot of cases, unless you're a true expert on that uh, commodity, you're not going to know. Like, for instance, I consider myself a uh, um, minor expert in coffee. I love it. The notes, the flavors and all that, but I'm not an expert. So I might be able to tell the difference from a Columbia blend versus a blend uh, coming out of Africa, but that's about it. But I know there's true experts out there that can drink a cup of coffee and tell you what region of South America it comes from and so forth. So unless you're that type of expert, realistically, you're not going to know. But there are blatant fraudulent activities. You know, I open a bag of chips or whatever, and it's supposed to be, you know, six ounces. And I look in and it's like a half a bag empty, you know. That's a blatant food fraud that obviously sticks to that consumer. And then, of course, the other way is if I get sick and then it's identified that uh, I got sick because of a fraudulent event. So that's realistically all. But if I go out and buy a product and it says organic, I have no clue if it's really organic. Um, but as a consumer, I'm hoping it is because I'm paying top dollar because I feel that this is, you know, the best choice for me or my family or whatever. Yeah. Okay, uh, Liz is just making a sort of a request there. Great presentation, but she'd like more region specific whether we can do that. I, I'm not sure, but she's enjoying it anyway. Uh, Eric, uh, are there any new regulations on the horizon uh, relating to food, food fraud that you know of? So I do know that in the U.S. they are looking at updating some of the FISMA requirements. I'm not specifically sure where it's at because as the pandemic started, it's, it's pushed back quite a few things for, I'm sure, many countries uh, because resources are focused on the pandemic and not uh, where, where they're at. And in fact, um, US, uh, the FDA just announced that they're going to start finally coming back in and doing uh, routine inspections um, as an example. But I am not quite sure, other than maybe um, uh, uh, what I'm hearing coming from uh, some of the Asian countries, I'm not aware of anything coming out for specifically packaging. Packaging, Labeling requirements have always been an issue uh, and, and a re regulatory requirement. If your label claims something, it's supposed to be there. If you're claiming a weight, it's supposed to be that weight. If it's claiming a uh, uh, provenance or origin, it's supposed to be there. So that, 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 that I tie to packaging myself. Um, but for those other things I was talking about, like food grade and non-food grade and things like that, 
there are laws, but again, there's no true requirements, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, Hanin, uh, using VASA, VACCP, according to FSC 22000, is that enough to... Uh, as long as you implement a robust program, and I'll be honest with you, FSSC just says do a vulnerability assessment. So realistically, I could list all my ingredients and I can say food fraud risk low. That's a vulnerability assessment, but really what did I do? Was it robust? Did I consider a lot of factors or did I just consider something small? So I can meet the requirements of FSSC and not have a good robust program. Mm -hmm. So I can meet the requirements but it might not be the best thing for my company or my products, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's why you said BRC is much more prescriptive and then uh, you have to meet those prescribed elements and, and they're auditable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Janelle, do the regulations cover only food stuff or are food additives, chemicals, materials used to manufacture food items included in the scope of regulations? Absolutely. If it is going as an ingredient to food or touching food for most countries, it is still falls into that food definition, if that makes sense. Okay. Pratima, uh, how to monitor con uh, or control a broker who is supplying raw materials by taking it from multiple farmers? So that's a challenge, but it also is something that can easily be managed by doing your own audits or making sure that the audit scheme you're requiring that 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 broker to do, you know, BRC, FSSC, that they are going to review food fraud and how they control that specific issue. There's also nothing wrong with still requiring that broker to get a GFSI audit or an AIB audit, but you still go and visit and maybe specifically focus on those hazards you're worried about. Like, hey, guys, so I'm worried about how you're getting it from the farmers and how you trace back to the farm. And there would be nothing wrong with talking to your broker or supplier or how they manage it. Maybe they don't, but you want them to. So you can open up that discourse on how is the best way that they can do that, that, that satisfy, satisfies your needs. Okay. Nicole says, say hi to the puppy. And uh, Ernie says, liking Cujo in the background. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> what, what, what's the, the dog called? Uh, the dog's name is Nora. Nora. She's about not, four pounds in a, in a tear when somebody comes to the door. No, noisy Nora. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, we're getting nowhere with these questions because the, the more you answer, the more come on. But So we're over, but are you all right staying for a little while? I yeah. am, sure. Great. Okay, Sonia, uh, will robust supplier approval process control food fraud activity? I won't say control. Because realistically, when it comes to fraud, because it's an intentional act, you're not controlling everything. You'd have to build like Fort Knox or um, the Buckingham Palace security procedures in order to do something like that. And no country or regulation expects that because the financial hardship would be too difficult. But when it comes to developing a robust supplier program, it can definitely help minimize your risk significantly by checking on that supplier to make sure that their programs are implemented appropriately, thereby reducing your risk. Oh, Chris, uh, has the reduction in on-site auditing uh, during COVID increased the potential for food fraud? Absolutely. And I'll use the FDA as an example. We have a regulation that's called the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, where this requires that the importer the one that's bringing the product into the United States, which could be a broker or could be the parent company, is required to uh, verify that that foreign supplier has implemented all of the FDA requirements for that product that they're shipping. This usually requires an annual on-site audit. And FDA also audits this program. And earlier this year, they actually suspended, because of the pandemic, the requirement of that annual site audit as long as a company or that importer could implement other controls to minimize the risk. And so um, it has potentially increased fraud, but again, you as a company could still do anything you want to to minimize your risk, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Uh, Danny, does does this one make sense to you, Earl? Does SQF require risk assessment as level one, two, three, or other measurements? Um, no, there's no specific risk rating system that you have to use, like one, two, three, or red, green, blue. You get to define it and how you want. It's just that I always encourage facilities, whatever you use, define it, and then make sure everybody that's going to be assisting in that vulnerability assessment clearly sees it the same way. The biggest challenge is when I've reviewed people's food fraud programs is we have very generic definitions of what a one, two, three, or whatever is. And then when the other team members are, are looking at, because I'll break them down, their definitions aren't identical. And so having that truly defined and training everybody on what that looks like is your best uh, uh, um, practice to do. Okay. Nancy, uh, what method of imported raw material supplier would you recommend if we cannot visit their plant? So another thing you could do is if they are following GFSI um, and, and they're getting an audit, you can ask for a copy of that audit. Two, supplier questionnaires. But if you're going to do supplier questionnaires, make sure they're open-ended. Like as an example, Instead of saying, did you do a food fraud vulnerability assessment, because more than likely that supplier is going to say yes, you can say, what methodology did you use to do your vulnerability assessment? Now they have to explain a lot more of how they did that vulnerability assessment, which allows you to review that answer to determine, oh, that's pretty robust, or no, that's not. If they did have mitigation strategies employed, you can ask for the documentation proof that they are doing it review that documentation. Are they really getting that C of A and checking it? Or are they really um, doing that audit from that supplier? Whatever that control measure is. And you can review those records in lieu of an audit and still feel comfortable that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Okay, uh, Katie, where can you find information on chemical adulteration? Horizon Scan and those programs are mostly agricultural based. They are agricultural based but they also do have like chemical hazards added in. Um, Trello also has any added information. Another good resource is managed by Michigan State University. They also have a food fraud database as well, and they include all types of food fraud, and I'm even including packaging. Uh, even Trello includes packaging food fraud issues too as well. <laughs> Eric says, uh, when do you use the giant sword and axe behind you? Are these, <laughs> are these for the most severe incidents of food fraud? <laughs> Absolutely correct. No, I'm just a big uh, collector of uh, medieval weaponry and even sometimes the fantasy genre. So uh, uh, I was lucky enough to spend quite a few years all over the world, Italy, uh, uh, Germany, Europe, and I've just collected things as I went. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Earl. Uh, Vinod, uh, how is the probability of food fraud in processed meat industry? So the probability, I won't say probability, but as we've seen in the example that happened in the UK with the horse meat scandal, there's been many documented cases of adding in extra fluid to gain weight, to uh, give subpar product, uh, to, I mean, there's so many potential ways, uh, uh, claiming that it's organic, but actually using it from uh, animals that have been uh, uh, injected with uh, drugs for disease prevention and things like this. Um, even claiming something's kosher or halal, but not really following those requirements is something that uh, can and possibly has happened before. Okay, uh, a long one from Nicole. Uh, can you confirm if we if it would be considered fraud if the claim is minimum and there is more active included? Please assume in this question that the excess does not cause a food safety issue for the consumer. Are the government standards for overage percentages? Does that make sense? I know most government agencies have what we call defect action levels. And this is the minimum amount of an item that could create a food safety issue. As an example, um, those of us that are in the baking industry or use wheat, mycotoxins are a potential hazard. It's a mold that grows and you can't cook it out. So if it's there, it's a potential food safety issue. But there are levels established on what is safe. It's not totally zero, but if you have this, this amount, it's safe to still consume, if that makes sense. I am not aware, though, of any overage percentages, if that makes sense. It's just the bare minimums of what is safe. Okay. Vinod, what is the major difference between food fraud and food adulteration? So food fraud is intentional. So 
I am doing this so I can make a profit in most cases. Food adulteration can be accidental, right? So I didn't do this on purpose. Maybe I didn't clean this piece of equipment, but it got adulterated accidentally. So that's kind of the different. Food adulteration could be a food fraud event. It also could be a food defense event or it could be a food safety event. Okay. Um, is the, is TASCP, T-A-C-C-P, standard applicable to manage food fraud together with food defense, two in one system, food fraud and food defense in one system? So it depends. As an example, some of you may be aware of the standard PASS 96. And in PASS 96, it combines TASCP and VASIP together in one program and suggests and, and makes recommendations and suggestions on how ma to manage both. But from a true GFSI standard, TASIP, your TASIP program is really focused on food defense alone. Your VASIP program is focused on food fraud. Yep. And uh, Rene, Rene, uh, um, in uh, printing ink, so it should be food grade, but was ordinary ink, would that be considered food fraud? It's fraud, isn't it? Yeah, Only if the requirement for that ink is supposed to be food grade. Like if it's an outer on a corrugate package, it's not going to come in contact with food. It's probably not even required to be food grade. But if that ink is going to touch product, then and they're not using food grade, but they're supposed to, that would be fraud. Yeah. Uh, how frequently should we review the vulnerability assessment? from? So from a GFSI perspective, they expect this to be a continuous process. They call that process horizon scan. So once you do your vulnerability assessment and you, imp and you put in place control measures if you needed to, you're still expected to continuously review because the factors that increase or decrease fraud can change. As an example, if you get an agricultural news report that say this year grapes in Greece is gonna have a bad crop yield, well, now that could, increase your risk of food fraud for anything that's using grapes out of Greece, right? So it could increase people claiming that it's coming from Greece and it's not because the price is going to go higher. I mean, so that's why you're expected to continuously review. If you do some of those paid for services that I mentioned, and I'm not selling these because AIB is not tied to any one of them, but you can get automatic reports if factors change that you've tied into your vulnerability assessment. So like if in grapes an ingredient and there's an increased risk, you get an email notification so you can go look and see what is that increased risk and does it impact me and my facility? So uh, there are those tools out there that can help that. Okay. Um, Abdallah's asking, can food fraud be internal or just external? But you mentioned before, mostly external, but Correct, can, yeah. can be internal. Now, just as an example in the um, UK horse meat scandal, that was observed to be internal, but not from the grocery stores where the issue was originally identified, but at that meat packing facility that was located in Czechoslovakia, I think it was. And it was identified there that that, that owner was doing that fraudulent event. So it could be internal, but really it's not going to be internal from an employee. It's going to be somebody up the ladder on the management uh, practices because an employee is not going to get a benefit of doing a fraudulent event for the owner, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, Heather's asking, um, where can I find a template? If you go on the full course with AIB, you provide a template, that's right? Uh, yeah, you can also reach out at info at AIBinternational.com and you can ask that individual in the email, is it possible to get a uh, template for a food fraud vulnerability assessment? And uh, one can be provided to you. Like I said, it's not a, a requirement to go to the course to get a copy of it. But I'll be honest, realistically, there's a lot better ones out there than the ones we use in the course, if that makes sense. But we're happy to share what we have. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you familiar with PASS, PAS 96-2017? Is it sufficient standard to ma manage both food defense and food fraud together? Abs Absolutely. It's got great recommendations in there and it applies to both your TASIP and VASIP program. So if you use that as your standard and you do it correctly and robustly, it can help help both issues. Okay. Um, uh, 
Are chemical hazards a type of food fraud? I think you mentioned that previously. Yeah. Um, and almost there. Yes, um, we will be sending the recording after the whole Q&A will be in it as well as a presentation. Um, allergen contamination can lead to food fraud. Um, Absolutely. And that would also be a good example of food fraud that leads to a food safety issue for those that are that have allergens. Actually, we did experience this, I want to say back in 2006, where um, cumin was recalled from many companies across the globe because it was identified as having peanut shells and allergen, um, peanut shells and almond shells, sorry. What had happened was India had a bad crop yield that year. The farmers at the local level were afraid that they were going to lose their farms because they weren't going to make what they normally would make. So they looked around and said, hey, you know what? If we grind up almond shells and peanut shells, it looks just like cumin. But they didn't think it would hurt anybody. And so they did that and it led to some potential food safety issues. Okay, we're getting there, Earl. <laughs> uh, Roy, what are, what are the basic parameters that should be assessed in food fraud vulnerability assessment, just basically? So one, if you're trying to meet FDA requirements as well as GFSI, the one main factor I would always consider is historical and food safety issues. But realistically, you want to look at the factors that are important for your facility and could identify increased risk. I mean, I'll give an example. I mentioned complication of the supply chain. If I'm getting, if I'm a, a facility located in the UK and I'm getting my uh, raw materials from, say, Vietnam, and it originates black pepper, we'll just use black pepper, it originates from Vietnam, but it goes to 12 different suppliers and distribution centers before it gets to me versus I'm buying it directly from Vietnam and it comes directly from that farmer to me, which one has more risk when it comes to fraud? So there's many different factors that you can look at and you want to look at what ones, but history and food safety, I would say is a must. Okay, uh, Iman, is there a checklist for food adulteration detection? Um, not that I'm aware of. However, from a regulatory requirement, like I said, there are those defect action levels of what would be considered adulteration for certain chemicals, and almost every country has them. So wherever you're exporting product to, or if you're making it for your own country, I would look for those lists first to make sure that you're in compliance. Okay. Uh, Vinod, how can we control our RM and PM suppliers to prevent supply chain from food fraud? You really can't control, but you can mitigate. And I can only say the best recommendation is self audits or have them go through an audit program of some sort and you get a copy of that report to see if they're implementing those programs you're requiring. Uh, a lot more and more I'm seeing companies implementing their own food fraud audits so that they can feel confident that supplier is doing a great job. Okay. Uh, oh, this one's fancy. It's got all little images of cake and temperatures. Sometimes some organizations which make cakes, uh, to make them faster, mm -hmm. make temperature higher to increase productivity and temperature affect the nutrition. Some things in this case, are they considered food fraud? So if they're claiming nutrients of a certain level and their process decreases that, that would be food fraud. Right. Okay. You've done it, Earl. The show must go on. That's the saying, isn't it? You're tremendous. You've done brilliant, as usual. Uh, I think everybody type in the sidebar, those of you who are, who are still on, and give thanks to Earl for his uh, fantastic knowledge, uh, his time and sharing today under sometimes undue pressure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, it's always my pleasure. I, I, yeah. I, I'm very happy to be here. You're one of my favorite presenters, Earl. Don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Earl. I'll see you on the next one. All Thank right. You. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. That was Earl Arnold from AIB International. Uh, I will be following up with an email with the uh, recording, the slides, uh, the certificate of attendance. Regarding the certificate of attendance, you either uh, print it and 
write name on it or open it in an image editing software such as Paint and type your name. We can't personalize it. There's, there's 1,500 people registered for this. So, yeah, really enjoyed that. Um, super presentation uh, from Earl. Uh, I've enjoyed your input. It's great to you all typing away in the sidebar. It's really, it makes it really engaging and enjoyable to do. Uh, IFSQN, you guys, you're the best. Um, lots of people do webinars now, but uh, I enjoy doing them still. And you are such a friendly and clever bunch. So happy Friday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great uh, weekend. And uh, we'll see you uh, on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.